Timing is everything in getting the most out of your efforts. Doing the right thing at the right time can greatly enhance the benefits of that thing. It also enhances your ability to perform well in that thing. Doing the right thing at the wrong time, even though it's the right thing, can greatly hamper the benefits and the performance of that thing. So in this episode of 8020 Productivity, we're going to talk about a very specific aspect of timing, getting timing right. And that is working in line with your own body's natural rhythms. It's going to be about making sure that you're doing the right activities at the right time to number one, increase your performance of that activity, making sure that you're doing the activity to the best of your abilities based on your natural rhythms. And number two, as a result, getting the most out of that activity. Because if you've performed it at the optimal time, the odds are you are going to get more benefit out of it. By the end of this episode, I would have given you a nice blueprint, a nice overview of what the science says about how our bodies change over the course of the day. And I will also give you a prescription for what could be an optimal daily routine. Um, so if that sounds interesting to you, you want to know when to exercise, when to eat, when to drink your coffee, when to chill out with the family, when to do most of the activities that we all do on a day-to-day -day basis, stay tuned. This episode is definitely for you. So welcome again to 8020 Productivity. Let's get right into it. I'll give you an outline of some of the things we'll cover over the course of this episode. The first thing that we'll talk about is what is a biological rhythm? Why does it exist? I'll tell you a story about how we arrived where we are, how the rhythms came about. I'll give you some scientific basis for these rhythms, give a little bit of the biology and physiology of it. Nothing too nerdy, nothing too deep. This science goes very deep, but we'll stay at the point where it's useful for us and go no deeper than that. And then I'll tell you about how your rhythms tend to change the rhythms of your body, your hormones, your body temperature. We'll talk about the interaction between the bodily clock, the inside clock, and the outside information and how that affects your performance. Then we'll go into what you are the what are the optimized activities to perform over the course of the day. A quick caveat though as we get into this, and that caveat is that the best time to do something that's beneficial to you is when you can do it. So even though I'll be laying out some of the optimal times to do certain things, when it comes to the really critical things for health and for performance and for living a fulfilled life, like spending time with family, like exercising, like doing your work that produces value, Yes, there might be an optimum time to do them, but doing them is more important than looking for the optimum time to do them. In other words, don't let the pursuit of optimum stop you from putting in the work that you can when you can. But this will give you something to shoot for so that as your autonomy increases, as you get more and more control over your time by living the law of the vital few, you kind of have some kind of benchmark that you're shooting for. Yeah, in the ideal world, in the ideal day, this is when I would be doing this thing. In the ideal day, this is when I would be executing this particular activity. So let's first of all start by talking about this concept of timing timing. Um, the Greeks had two words for time. They had the chronos and they had the kairos. Chronos, you might recognize it from the word chronometer, which is basically physical time. Um, the quantity of time, talking about milliseconds, seconds, minutes, uh, hours, days, and so on. Chronos is the ticking of time. Then they had Kairos. Kairos is a more interesting, almost more philosophical definition of time. And Kairos defines the opportune time. So Kairos means that if there, there is an opportune time to do something. If you want to ask somebody for something, perhaps the opportune time is when they're in a good mood. That opportune time might have nothing to do with Kronos. It might not be 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. or 7 p.m., but Kairos is the opportune time. When we talk about doing things according to your rhythm, matching your activities to your natural rhythms, we're dealing in some sense in a very interesting way with both Kronos and Kairos. Because Kronos, which we'll see as we get into this, is the biological ticking of the clock of time. But then Kairos is using that window of opportunity during that time of the biological clock to do the best thing for that time. 
So this concept of timing is really important as we get into this episode. But the question might have come up, why does this even exist? Why is rhythm, why is biological rhythms according to time even a thing? And to be able to answer that, we first of all have to talk about what rhythms exist. And even before that, talk about how we've evolved on this beautiful planet Earth and how that has impacted these rhythms that we experience and that we live by. Day and night is constantly happening, both in relation to the sun. The sun, as you know, is the single largest body in our solar system. Solar actually relates to sun, and it's the giver of light, and in many ways, a lot would argue, even the source of the biological life. All life on Earth depends, to some extent, on solar energy. Now, why is this important? Imagine over hundreds of thousands of years, the Earth has been rotating on its own axis, turning, facing the sun, and certain parts of the Earth turning away from the sun, producing basically day and night, roughly 24-hour cycles. Then at the same time, this Earth, as it rotates, it rotates around the sun as well, giving us our years. Right? So even our very definition of how time works is in relation to this, to the relationship between the Earth and the sun. If you were an organism evolving on this planet that is constantly going through these cycles, it makes sense that you adapt in your evolution to those cycles. And that's what forms the basis of a lot of the cycles we'll be talking about today. So once you've understood that, you can see now that, yeah, it does make sense that your body is adapted to do certain things well at certain times of the day. And as we'll see, a lot of that is based on light and dark, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So that's the foundation. That's the conceptual and somewhat even evolutionary scientific basis for why these rhythms probably exist. And to, to, to just put a, just to put a bit of an emphasis on that point. These rhythms exist in every species. I did not say in every human or every mammal or every animal. It exists in every species, which tells us that it is truly universal and it is probably linked very closely to the cycles I just described, the day and night cycle of the earth and the yearly cycle of revolving around the sun. So with that foundation, let's now talk about the kinds of rhythms that exist. If you're watching this or listening to this, you probably already are familiar with circadian rhythms. The circadian rhythm is the most popular rhythm. Everybody talks about, oh, are you working in with your circadian rhythm? Oh, your circadian rhythm is thrown off. A lot of people who use that term just understand that the circadian rhythm is the 24 hour cycle that the body, that the human body goes through. Again, that 24 hour, that 24 number is, is reminiscent of the day and night cycle of the earth. But when we talk about day and night, there is another rhythm, which is the diurnal rhythm, which really is di, two, right? And that diurnal rhythm is about day and night specifically, not so much 24 hour cycles. So the circadian rhythm talks about the 24 hour cycle. The diurnal rhythm talks about how you relate to day and night. So that's why you have some organisms like the bat, for example, that is a nocturnal animal. So its activity is higher at night and less during the day. That's how it's adapted. That's how it's evolved. For us, we're day dwellers, we're not vampires. So we are active during the day and relatively inactive should be, we'll talk about that in a second, inactive at night. So that's the circadian rhythm, the 24 hour clock and the diurnal rhythm, the day and night. Then there's also the ultradian rhythm. The ultradian rhythm works in roughly 90 minute cycles throughout the day. So you could say that the ultradian rhythm is somewhat nested in our circadian rhythm and also in our diurnal rhythm. So over the course of the day, we have these 90 minute cycles of energy that we cycle through. It's how we sleep as well. Usually a full sleep cycle is about 90 minutes and that should actually educate how we sleep and how long we sleep for. Roughly about five cycles is what you wanna shoot for. And that's why this eight to eight and a half hour thing I mean, is such a big deal. It's really about getting through enough 90 minute cycles of sleep so that you are truly restored and rested. So that's the, we've talked about the circadian, the diurnal, and we've also now touched on the um, ultradian. 
one cycle that I discovered while researching this episode that I don't hear a lot of people talk about, and I found it very fascinating, and I want to share it with you. It may not have as much impact on when you do things during the day, but I think it's cool to learn about it. It's the circa annual rhythm. This is a rhythm that is related not just to the day and night that we talked about, but also to that revolution around the sun, which is the year, the seasons, how the seasons change. Because remember, the earth is on a bit of an axis and it's a bit tilted. So as it rotates and goes around the sun, different parts of the earth experience different seasons. And it's interesting to learn that human beings also have a bit of a circa annual rhythm. Nothing as extreme as maybe a bear that will full out hibernate during the winter time, like gorge and gorge itself with food and then hibernate over winter and then wake up again in spring to do it all over again. We're not that extreme, or I should say we're not that emphatic in our circa annual rhythm. But in this paper that I found, and I'll put a link to all of this research in the show notes, human beings also show um, a circa annual rhythm. It says here, um, this is a paper called Circadian Control of Brown Adipose Tissue. It was looking into how the circadian rhythm affects how our bodies basically handle fat. And you'll see in a second that that's a pretty um, cool angle to circadian rhythms as well. But it says here that brown adipose tissue is higher in winter as compared to the summer months. There's research about that. And indeed, it says 10 days of cold exposure recruits brown adipose tissue in humans. So we also have our own kind of circa annual rhythm that's going on. When it starts to get cold, it actually alters how our bodies treat fat. So I thought that was a cool little detail that you might be interested in. So those are the four rhythms that I want to share with you. We have the circadian, 24-hour. We have the ultradian, 90-minute. We have the diurnal, day and night. And then we have the seasonal or circa annual. All right. Excellent. Let's go back to the two that will inform, or I'd say the three that would inform a lot of our conversation today on this concept of timing and doing more by doing less by staying in sync with our rhythms. And that would be the circadian, the diurnal, and all tradian, the 90-minute cycles. How do these cycles come about? How do they influence how we feel and what we do? First thing we want to talk about is how these cycles influence our experience of the day. They influence everything from our mood, which is more subjective, to our energy, our ability to focus, our ability to perform physical exercise. They influence our core body temperature, which we will see is very important. They also influence the hormonal, the biochemistry of our bodies. And that's an important detail because as you know, hormones affect our experience of life if you have certain elevated levels of some hormones, your experience is different from if you have a decreased um, concentration of certain hormones in your body. And how these interactions happen boils down to two clocks in the body. And when I say two clocks, it's really one clock and a second class of clocks. So let's talk about these biological clocks now. The first clock is the super charismatic nucleus. You might have heard about this, the SCN. By the way, I'm laying all this foundation so that when we get into the prescriptions for how to go about the day, it makes more sense and you, you have a solid foundation to make decisions and to tweak decisions based on your own experience. The SCN is the master biological clock in the human brain. And it pretty much tells the body to some extent what time it is. So in some sense, this is like a physical clock. It's ticking on this 24-hour cycle. Actually, the research shows it's roughly 24.8 thereabouts. Um, when they've done studies where they've put people in spaces where they don't have any external input, they tend to, their bodies tend to sync up to a 24.8-hour cycle. So that's the SCN. We'll just call it the SCN from now on. But then the body also has peripheral clocks. So remember, this super charismatic nucleus is the central clock. Then the body also has peripheral clocks. And every single cell in the body actually shows some form of this circadian rhythm. So the peripheral clocks, like there are clocks that are in the liver, even in our muscles, that determine how the, how the time of day, the biological clock, translates to other aspects of the body. Now, the question then becomes, how do these clocks know what time it is? 
this is where the concept of alignment to these rhythms becomes even more intriguing. So in one sense, these clocks act like normal clocks. They tick away and tick away and roughly approximate 24-hour cycles. That's fine. Circadian rhythm, check. However, there's also a concept of Zeitgebers. Zeitgeber is from the German word, and it means literally time giver. So unlike your well, unlike your mechanical clock that will tick and tick and tick no matter what's happening. If you put a clock out in the in the desert, it doesn't matter if it's daytime or nighttime or whatever, that clock is gonna just tick and tick and tick and tick and tick, and nothing's gonna happen to change how it works. <laughs> as long as it has batteries in it or whatever, power. But when it comes to our biological clocks, remember how we started out by talking about the day and night cycle that has really, really defined the experience of every species on Earth? Our biological clocks depend on Zeitgebers. And Zeitgebers are, again, time givers, which are external to some extent. So while your body might be syncing up to a 24-hour clock, it also depends on what's happening for it to kind of judge what time it is, if that makes sense. Uncoupling those two time, those two forms of timekeeping, that is uncoupling what's happening externally from what is happening internally, in, in, in the mildest sense can affect our performance and affect our experience. But in the worst sense, as they've seen as has been shown in research with shift workers who work these basically out of sync clocks for a long time, it can lead to terrible health outcomes, um, metabolic syndrome, um, diabetes, and even heart disease when you are so out of sync in a chronic way. So that's kind of serious, isn't it? Uh, most of us listening to this, if you're not a shift worker, probably won't affect you. If you are a shift worker, um, I'd say take some, consider how it might be affecting you so that you can make adjustments if needed. So that's the Zeitgerber concept. Now, there are a few Zeitgerbers that I want you to be aware of, and that's what's going to form the basis for how you choose the activities you perform. The first and most important Zeitgerber, by a long shot, is light. Light is so powerful and influential in what happens inside our bodies. Light is so powerful in how it influences our internal clocks, that it's really, really hard, based on the research that I've seen, to overstate that importance. And this makes sense. If you evolved on a planet that for millions of years was going through a light and dark circle over 24 hours, not only does that light affect you deeply and directly, but it also affects when you can do things. Think about that for a second. Up until very recently, the Industrial Revolution, when we did not have artificial lighting, when the sun came up, it was light, and when the sun went down, it was dark. It's almost, imp it's so difficult to conceive that today with all of our artificial lights around us. Right now, I'm in this room, I'm using artificial lights. Granted, it's daytime outside, but this could as well be 11 p.m. at night because of my access to artificial lights. I can go ahead and work right now. And that's a critical point because light determines when we do things. Also, and this is me extrapolating just somewhat commonsensically from the research and just observation, that because we get our light from the sun, the light also influences temperature. So not surprising, one of the second, the second Zeitgerber is temperature. Your core body temperature really fluctuates in a synchronized way over the course of the day with your circadian rhythm. So the number one Zeitgerber we've talked about is light. Influencing how and when you're exposed to light can really change how your body responds, how awake, alert you feel, or how sleepy you feel. Second one we've talked about now is temperature. The third one is physical activity. So when you are being very physically active, perhaps at a time when it's not quote unquote ideal for you to be based on your circadian rhythm, you are giving your body a weird kind of out of sync signal that your body still 
considers to figure out what time it is. So physical activity is a big one. And the third one, perhaps the one that blew my mind the most, is eating when you eat. This was surprising to realize how much of an impact eating has on the synchronicity or out of synchronicity of your biological clock with the Zeitgerbers, your internal clock with the external Zeitgerbers. But I have a theory based on something, a statement that was made in this research paper, the circadian control of brown adipose tissue. And I'm going to read that statement to you real quick before I make that, before I make that. And this is probably not original. Somebody already probably came up with this out there in the road somewhere. But here's what it says. It says, the photo period, the amount of daylight perceived, very important, serves as the primary Zeitgerber, which we've talked about already. But it goes on then to say, the rhythm of feeding behavior, for example, acts as a powerful synchronizer for peripheral clocks, which we talked about, in the liver, muscle, and fat tissue, get this, while leaving the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, while leaving the SCN in most cases unaffected. Now, the research paper doesn't say this, but my suspicion is that because of how closely synced we are to the earth, to the rotation of the earth, to the day and night, our diurnal and circadian rhythm, I suspect that over time, because our activities, i.e. eating, a Zeitgerber, physical activity, a Zeitgerber, because, and even to some extent, temperature, a Zeitgerber, because those are locked in, in sync with the sun, my suspicion is the SCN prioritizes a light, whereas the peripheral ones are more easily influenced by the activities. Why is that so? Historically, evolutionarily, when are we most active? When it's bright out. When are we least active? When it's dark. When is it the warmest? When it's light out. When is it the coolest? When it's dark. So this is my suspicion. There's probably research out there. Somebody else way smarter and way more expert than me in this has probably thought about it. But I haven't seen that in the research, at least that I have read so far. Now, this might all sound like what's all this got to do with when to do what I need to do. It's about understanding the concepts themselves so that you can make a confident decision about when you do the things you do. But with all that foundation, let us now look into what could be an ideal daily routine based again on what's happening in our bodies over the course of the day. I think we'll start off with um, the morning time. Let's start off with the morning time and maybe we'll go from about 6 to 12, 12 to 6 and 6 to 12 again. Let's just go like that, maybe these six hour blocks and then we'll try to define it. All right. Let's say you wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning. Depending on where you are on the face of the, of the planet and what season it is, circa annual rhythm, it's either light out or it's still a bit dark out. If it's winter time in a place like Calgary where I live, it's probably very dark out. If you live around the equator, tropical areas, it's probably starting to get bright. Regardless, when you wake up in the morning, hormonally, your cortisol is peaking. Cortisol is one of the two classes. Well, cortisol is a specific hormone from the two classes of hormones that influence or that show very strong circadian rhythms. And those hormones are the glucocorticoids and melatonin. Those two are kind of the big ones. And for us as humans, our main glucocorticoid is cortisol. <laughs> a lot of cord cortisol in that sentence. But this is important and you'll see why in a second. So cortisol is often thought about by most lay people, such as myself, as the stress hormone. Came to learn that it's actually more of an alertness hormone, not a stress hormone. And one of the ways to get your cortisol level to go up is, you guessed it, getting light. So again, think back to the evolutionary past as a caveman living in a cave. Sun comes up, your eyes open it's time to start the day. So it's not surprising that your cortisol peaks in the morning. Very interestingly, at the hit of light, the other class of 
hormones, the uh, of hormone melatonin, specifically for us humans, drops to virtually unmeasurable amounts, imperceptible amounts in the body. This is also interesting because melatonin is the relaxation, the sleeping hormone from the diurnal point of view and also from the circadian point of view. So when you wake up in the morning, what's the best thing to do? Um, well, the first thing, if, you, if that doesn't happen naturally through the window, is to get light in your eyes, to signal to your body that, hey, melatonin, you can stop now. Cortisol, you can start now. That would be a good thing to do. As far as the best activities for the morning, let's talk about cognition and let's talk about physical activity. Let's talk about what to eat, when to eat, if to eat. Most people wake up in the morning and the first thing they do is make a cup of coffee because coffee wakes them up. And that's okay, but it's not ideal. Why is it not ideal? Because your body's cortisol level gradually rises over the course of the day. If you ingest caffeine right away in the morning, you kind of hijack that natural, that natural process. And you, as we know from the research, and I'll find the research and put it in the show notes, caffeine kicks in at about 15 minutes after you've ingested it, depending on how fast you drink it. And it peaks about 90 minutes later, and then it starts to diminish. Roughly, your ultradian rhythm which remember is a 90 minute cycle, is also going through a similar cycle. So if you ingest caffeine right away in the morning and you don't allow your ultradian rhythm to reach its natural 90 minute cycle, it's going to dip along with probably the dip in your caffeine. So you will experience roughly more of a crash. And this is something that's born on the literature. Again, Dr. Andrew Huberman talks about this a lot, but going through the research myself, I found that it's, it's really interesting how that plays out. And I've experimented with this myself. So the best time it appears to consume your caffeine is roughly 90 minutes after you've woken up, preferably after you've gotten some sunlight, ideally sunlight or really bright daylight uh, simulation, simulated daylight into your eyes. So a good time to consume your caffeine is 90 minutes after you've woken up. We'll talk a little bit more about caffeine as we go ahead. Another really good thing to do in the morning is mindfulness and meditation. So why is this a thing? Um, it's not so much about the circadian cognition part of things, but it's more about the state of mind you're in. In the morning, you are probably the calmest because your cortisol is just starting to peak, but you're also very awake. Um, so that would be a good time to practice mindfulness. It's also a good way to get a, phys a mental victory early on in the morning, kind of set the course for your day in a very mindful way. Mindfulness, as is, the research is replete with this, has a lot of physiological, physical benefits as well. So getting that kind of feel-good benefit of mindfulness going in the morning is a great thing to do. Um, Interesting, I came across some research that was um, looked at users of meditation apps, and they found out that people who meditated in the morning, based on the data collected from those apps, surprise, surprise, apps collect your data, <laughs> they saw, I think it was about a 40 to 50% increase in adherence <laughs> when it came to their meditation. So if meditation is something you want to do more regularly, you're probably better off doing it in the morning because after the morning, at least according to this research based on this particular app, the odds of being of continuing and being consistent precipitously drops. So that would be a good time to meditate. The question then becomes, when's the best time to exercise? Exercising in the morning has its pros, but it also has its cons. The pro of exercising in the morning is because as a Zeitgeber, a time giver, rigorous physical activity increases alertness. So it's okay to exercise once it's light out. So that's an argument for exercise in the morning. It peaks your cortisol even higher, right? The flip side, though, is most world records in performance are set closer to noon. Why is that? 
core body temperature. Your core body temperature is roughly at its lowest in the morning, which means muscular activation and even digestion, which we'll talk about next, is kind of it's kind of ramping up at this point. So by the afternoon, early afternoon, 11 p.m. to between you know around 12 or so, is when your core body temperature reaches its peak. Surprise, surprise! At high noon, remember the sun again. So most world records in performance are set closer to that time. Also, interestingly, early to early evening, your core body temperature goes to another kind of peak early evening. So if you're not exercising in the morning, a reason to exercise in the afternoon or early evening might be if you're pursuing a performance goal. I said early evening, late afternoon, not late evening. And so that early evening um, is more suited, early afternoon, early evening, late afternoon, is more suited to performance type pursuits. So whether or not you exercise in the morning or in the afternoon, like I said at the beginning of the episode, get your exercise in when you can. But if you're like me, I favor the early morning exercise. And that brings us to the topic of caffeine again. One of the reasons why I favor exercising in the morning is twofold. Number one is psychological. Exercising in the morning, not only does it match up with the increase in cortisol and works with your rhythm, your circadian rhythm, your diurnal rhythm, but psychologically, it's amazing. It feels great to win early in the morning. It just feels fantastic. You set up for the day. You're set up for the day. This time of day is what's called in the literature the active phase. So it's perfect for that. Um, I'm not really pursuing any kind of performance. Um, I'm not a power lifter trying to get a PR or something or, or any kind of, I'm not a professional runner trying to beat time. For me, it's about keeping healthy, um, building a strong, healthy body into late in late in life, later into building a strong, healthy body and training for longevity and fitness. So for me, working on the morning makes perfect sense. Get it out of the way. Also, my schedule right now means that if I get that workout early in the morning, I can settle into doing other things, perhaps more cognitive in nature, which we'll talk about in a second. All right. Which brings me to the second aspect of it, which is not just psychological, but physiological, caffeine. I use caffeine in the form of coffee or pre-workouts in the morning. And I recently found a research paper that showed that if you consume about 200 milligrams of caffeine in the day, which is roughly what you'd get in a small cup of really strong coffee or a scoop of a relatively mild or, you know, moderately intense pre-workout drink. Here's the thing. You need about 9 to 12 hours for that to metabolize to the point where it does not affect your sleep. Ideally, you don't want to consume that caffeine any later than 13 hours before you plan to go to bed if you don't want that caffeine to affect you. That blew my mind because I know people who have the first cup of coffee, second cup of coffee, third cup of coffee, and supposedly they can still sleep. The research would argue with that, would show that unless they have a very special biochemistry, which is a thing that happens, that they can metabolize caffeine faster than other people, these mutants are among us, <laughs> then they, they might be sleeping, but they're not getting good quality sleep. For me, I know that the earlier I consume my caffeine, the better I sleep later at night. Why does this matter for you? It matters because if you do drink caffeine, if you do drink coffee or tea or pre-workouts for your exercise, then when you drink it is important. Once you get past 9, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., the research would suggest that it's probably not a great idea anymore at that point. So that's yet another reason for me to consume my caffeine and get my exercise in earlier on in the morning. Whether you exercise on the morning, your coffee, better early than later. Oh, and that brings me to today's episode sponsor, which is Magic Mind. So Magic Mind is something I've discovered late last year. It's a little two ounce bottle that is 
um, many things, but it's an adaptogen. It's a nootropic. A nootropic is something that boosts your cognitive abilities. An adaptogen is something that helps your body adapt physiologically to stress. But in the context of today's conversation, why Magic Mind is so useful and so applicable to helping you over the course of your day and balancing your rhythms is Magic Mind has a very interesting um, property based on its proprietary blend of different nootropics and ingredients, including bacopa monieri, uh, matcha, ceremonial matcha green tea extract, um, ashwagandha, and a couple of others. What, and oh, especially L-theanine, what Magic Mind does is it helps even out and extend the effects of caffeine, which are not only useful for physical exercise, but as we will see later on, even for cognitive work. So here's the routine that I've been using with a lot of success of late. In the morning, I wake up, try to get some light in my eyes as soon as I can. I have some really powerful lamps here in my office. I come down to the office, I turn them on, they're kind of over my face as I try to usually get my journaling done in the morning, and then I will do my mindfulness practice first thing in the morning. During this time, my body is waking up. The light is there, but I'm also enjoying the benefits of that mindfulness. Shortly thereafter, I'll grab a shot of Magic Mind. They come in these little two ounce bottles. I'll drink that, and depending on whether or not it's a workout day, I will then either drink my pre-workout which contains caffeine, or I'll make my cup of coffee, have my coffee, and then settle into work. What you find happens when you use that combination of magic mind and coffee, whether it's for a pre-workout or for, or for your cognitive work, is the L-theanine, along with other ingredients in the magic mind, they extend and taper off the effect of that caffeine. So you're never really jittery like caffeine tends to make you do. If you get the jitters from caffeine, definitely try Magic Mind. You're never really jittery. And then you don't experience that 90 minute peak and that crash that tends to come after. So instead of your caffeine lasting, you know, between 90 minutes to two hours or two and a half, the L-theanine and basically the blend of Magic Mind allows that caffeine to last much longer. So it's like, it's like you're even keel, but you have this kind of calm alertness over the course of the day. In your workouts, it'll benefit you, and in your cognitive work, it'll benefit you as well. Um, the makers of Magic Mind reached out to me last year, and they're offering listeners of 8020 Productivity 20% off on top of whatever discount is happening on the site currently. So you get 20% off extra on the 30-day subscription plan, which is what I've been on on my own money, this is how much I've enjoyed Magic Mind. And they know you'll enjoy it so much that they're willing to send you your money back if for any reason within 30 days you didn't like the product. So it's really very zero risk if you want to try it out and you want to support 8020 Productivity. Go to magicmind.com slash 8020 Productivity and use the discount code PRD20. That's P as in Paul, R as in Robert, D as in David, 20 for an extra 20% off your purchase of Magic Mind. Hope you check that out and I hope it helps you. All right, let's get back into the episode. All right, so when do you eat? It's a good question. When do you eat? Now, if you, this might be a good time to talk about time-restricted eating, at least to introduce the subject. If you're listening to this and you do intermittent fasting, which is a process of eating, eating where you you eat for a certain window of the day and then you fast for a certain window of the day, window of the day, usually larger than when you eat. Usually um, six, six, 18, six is common. So you eat within six hours of the day and then you fast for 18. Another really popular one is eight, 16, which is the one that seems to work the most for more people. So you have a bigger eating window of eight hours and then you're fasting for 16 hours. Why is that important? Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of research that shows that time restricted eating is beneficial just based on your if you if your goal is to lose fat, lose weight, get fit, not eating throughout the day makes sense. <laughs> of course it makes sense, doesn't it? Because again, your circa because again, our circadian rhythm, 24 hour clock, let's think about this. How much access would a caveman 
without artificial lighting have had to food. When you hunt, when you prepare the food, when you consume the food, is tightly synced, locked in with how much light is available. Hunting at night, if you were a caveman, would be a very bad idea because at that point, you're more likely to become food than to find food. So most times at night, activity was very low. Again, diurnal rhythm. So when to eat is kind of prescribed by our diurnal rhythm. We eat when it's light out. That, that, that's straightforward. But of course, like everything else, there's more nuance to it. So let's actually walk through the day. So right now we're at about 7 a.m., aren't we? 7, 7.30 a.m. You want to get your first meal in. And honestly, I didn't do this for a long time until I found this research. You want to get your first meal in before 10 a.m. This is because your core body temperature is rising, your, your metabolism is ramping up really fast, and this is when you will not only be able to digest your food the most efficiently, but when your body actually needs the food the most. Remember, you've been fasting, as it were, overnight, and your body is depleted of, 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 of nutrients at this point, and you really want to feed your body something. As a person who has practiced intermittent fasting for some time, I used to not eat until noon or 1 p.m., so a later time-restricted window. But looking at this research, I'm convinced. It makes sense to use an earlier time-restricted window, and we'll talk about what that time-restricted window is ideally once we get to the end of this section of this conversation. So you want to get some food in before 10 a.m. Um, like we said, metabolism's ramping up. You've been fasting. Your body needs these nutrients. Get your first meal in. It turns out it is true. Breakfast is apparently the most um, important meal of the day. So get some solid food in. As for what to eat, you want to eat a fairly balanced, balanced meal. You want to get some good, healthy carbohydrates, some high protein, ideally, and a little bit of fat in there is fine too. Um, I'm not a dietitian, but whatever your goals are, if you're training and you want to build muscle, of course, what you eat and the calories you consume will be different from someone who's trying to lose weight, but make sure that you don't skimp on the protein and you get some healthy carbohydrates in there and or fats. So at about 10 a, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. What else can you be doing during this window based on circadian rhythms? Your attention and your alertness is also peaking at this time. So this is a very good time for you to do heavy cognitive tasks. Now, when I say heavy, I use that word intentionally. Heavy means heavy lift, things that are somewhat more difficult. Um, the research shows, and I'll see if I can pull up um, that research paper here. It's a research paper here titled, A Time to Think, Circadian Rhythms in Human Cognition. And it breaks down, and I'll see, I'll probably set a link, put a link to this one as well. And it outlines the different types of attention and um, cognitive processes that follow the circadian rhythm. Now, the challenge with circadian rhythm research is the language used to describe cognitive work varies so much. It could be anything from like attention, being able to hold attention, to being able to, to manipulate um, physical objects. So it's really hard to say just based on this was a meta-analysis looking at other research papers to say this is when you should do this kind of task. But we'll try to parse that out in this episode for you. So we have attention, memory, and executive function. Without going into too much detail, attention is alertness and arousal, selective attention and flexibility of attention, then divided attention, which is your ability to split your attention, sustained attention, or what is called vigilance, and then you have sleepiness or fatigue, which is, you know, refers to a subjective, to, to, to continuous performance when you start to feel fatigue, your ability to, to overcome that. Then you have memory. So the first one was attention. Then you have memory. Memory is talking about working memory. 
right? Episodic memory, which is the ability to store and recall events. Semantic memory, which is memory related to the meaning of things, lists, um, outlines, things of that nature. Procedural memory, which is memory of how to perform an action. And then you have perceptual or the representation system, how your, how your mind is able to represent information in your memory. They have executive functions, basically self-control, right? Inhibition, the ability to shift calm focus and shift attention. You have um, rule deduction and categorization. And then planning, of course, is also an executive function. Um, in the most general terms, and this is the biggest takeaway for you here. You've probably heard it before, but it's interesting to know the science behind it. In the most general terms, you want to do your heaviest and most difficult cognitive tasks when your alertness, your working memory, and your executive functions are at their highest. And that happens between the hours roughly of 7 a.m. and noon, with a very clear dip at noon. Hence, the infamous lunch hour slump. That's it. You can go now. <laughs> but of course, there's more to it than that. Um, in one of the research papers I found, which was a meta-analysis of cognitive um, circadian rhythm research, it showed that between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m., 10 to about 11, 12-ish, is when your alertness is highest, your memory is at its best, and your executive functions of planning and inhibition and the like are also at their best between the hours again of six or seven to about noon. That's when you want to do your heaviest work. Now, there's something interesting that came up in the research. Interestingly, your ability to pay attention, in no, no, we talked about vigilance, sustained attention, in the psychomotor domain, that is your ability to manipulate objects and, and, and the like, given that it is not also very cognitively demanding, that seems to be sustainable throughout the day. So if you are maybe a person who works in the trades or a craftsman and you want to learn about a certain technique, do the learning of that technique because that's a heavy cognitive lift. Do that earlier in the day. If you want to practice and actually create your craft, build the things, work on the engines, psychomotor vigilance seems to work, seems to be, seems to be good pretty much throughout the day. So that's a little nuance there for you. Depending on the kind of work you do, you could tweak that. So you might wake up and be like, oh, I have so much energy. I'm going to go build this thing that I know how to build. Pause. You might be better off doing that after the lunch hour slump or even maybe during the lunch hour slump, as long as it doesn't affect your vigilance to you know, protect yourself and not hurt yourself. You might be better off learning and doing something more cognitively demanding, something that, again, tests your, aware your alertness, your working memory, your memory in general, and your executive function, the difficult things. So that's a scientific basis, again, for eating the frog, right? Doing the most difficult thing early in the morning. So now we're coming up around noon. You've meditated. You've maybe, if you're like me, you've exercised. You've had a healthy, hearty breakfast. You've done some work. How do we build in the ultradian rhythm into that? 90-minute cycles. In your exercise, for me, I like to exercise in sync with my ultradian rhythm. So my exercises last between an hour and 90 minutes to match that um, ultradian rhythm. Usually it will peak at about an hour, which is typically what happens in the, in the ultradian rhythm. And then I start to feel that dip and then I start to taper off. You can use that as well. If you work in those 90-minute cycles, you'll get the most out of your exercise or your workouts. When it comes to your cognitive work, the same thing applies. And this is why I'm a big believer in using the Pomodoro technique. If you're not familiar with it, you can look it up, Pomodoro, P-O-M-O-D-O-R-O, -O -O, where you set a timer and you work for between, you work intensely and intently for between 25 to 30 minutes at a time, taking short five-minute breaks. So you do 20 or 25 minutes, take a break, you're at 30 minutes. Another 25 minutes, take a break, you're at an hour. Another 25 minutes, take a break, you're at an hour and 90 minutes. And then you take a longer break of between 25 to between 15 to 25 minutes. 
the Pomodoro technique until I re read this research and got deep into this. I had used it without really understanding why it worked so much. But now with an understanding of the Altradian rhythm, you can see why the Pomodoro technique works so much. It's pretty much syncing to your 90 minute Altradian cycle. So whether you're working out, um, I wouldn't use the Pomodoro technique for working out, obviously. Just train and then right around the hour to hour 15 mark, give yourself a nice long break. You're done the workout. But for your cognitive work, Pomodoro technique does seem to work very well with the all trading rhythm. If you'd rather go straight and not break, the magic number seems to be between 55 to 60 minutes of work and then about 17 to 20 minutes of rest. So if you don't want to do the Pomodoro 25, 30 breaking type of system, then just go hard for probably no more than an hour and then give yourself a nice long break. There's actually research showing that using, there was a I'll put the link in the show notes. They arrived at about a split of 52-17, looking at the most productive members of a particular organization versus the least productive. They found out the more productive did not necessarily work more. As a matter of fact, they worked less in terms of a fraction of the day when they're working, but they had these really intensive hour 52, 55 minute sprints where they worked really hard and then they took breaks. They took 17, 20 minute breaks on average. So that's another way to work with your rhythm, matching your circadian, diurnal, and all trade rhythm. So right now we're at about noon, right? Noon, 1230-ish. What is the best thing to do at this time? Remember, cortisol is peaking. It's right around its peak right now. Um, but then if you've had caffeine without magic mind, the caffeine is kind of worn off. It's gone. You're experiencing the caffeine crash. However, interesting point here. If you had observed the 90 minute um, delay before ingesting caffeine, this crash would be much less. Whether or not you use Magic Mind, the crash would be much less because you would have allowed your body to ramp up its cortisol naturally before you introduce caffeine. So there you go. Another little hint for you there. But regardless, you will feel a dip in energy. The worst thing to do at this time is to just try to power through more cognitive work. You, you're more likely to make mistakes and you're more, you're more likely to just be miserable. So don't do that. <laughs> Take a break, right? If you've gone through a few cycles of Pomodoro or you've exercised and now you've done some heavy cognitive work, take a break. Another good thing, interestingly, to do at this time, and, and I've done with success on certain days, is if I don't work out in the morning, this is an amazing time to get a workout in. Why is that? Because it's in the middle of the day. If you go and you exercise now, even if it's a light exercise, um, a little zone two training, a soft jog, a quick walk or some stretches, this has a way of kind of boosting your energy again. You know, a Zeitgerber to keep you in the active phase. Boost your energy if you're working out in a gym that has a shower. Taking a nice cool shower after that kind of resets your body temperature again. And your body actually starts to try to get warm again because you've kind of cooled it down a little. I found that for me, that helps a lot and is very refreshing. You come back and you have energy again, just in time for another um, crest in your, in your circadian rhythm toward the late afternoon. So if you can get a little workout in, some stretches, some, some nice mobility work, something that just keeps you moving. Or if you haven't had caffeine, see if you can have a nap at this time. So really it's kind of these two extremes, right? That I'm suggesting either you go exercise, nothing too crazy, or have a nap. It's a perfect time for a mid-afternoon nap. Nothing wrong with that at all. Keeping the diurnal rhythm in mind, I would say don't nap for more than 90 minutes or as short as 30 minutes. So if you nap for 30 minutes, you get some refreshment, you're good to go. If you're gonna go more than 30, shoot for 90 so that at least you get the full sleep cycle in and that way you're waking up at the end of a deep sleep cycle, not in the middle of it so that you wake up alert. So I should have mentioned this, lunch hour time is a good time to have lunch, <laughs> duh. Have a good lunch if you can around that time of day. Fantastic. This is again between the early afternoon. If you've had your first meal, 
a good time to have a second meal. Oh, and I forgot to mention, a lot of knowledge workers work regular hours. They work regular jobs. So the noontime is not magically the end of their day. It's about halfway through the day. So what can you do productively post-lunch if you work in, say, an office setting? Well, the same principle applies. You want to do something that is somewhat cognitively valuable, but not cognitively demanding, not a heavy lift. So if you go through that in your mind, like what are some of the things I could do that would still be engaging with my mind to some extent, but would not be a heavy lift? You can look at some meetings if that's a good time to book meetings, not brainstorming sessions. Brainstorming sessions typically be a heavy lift, um, not strategy type of meetings, not like heavy cognitively demanding meetings, not very creative meetings, but like status updates are great for after lunch. Um, you're there, you can pay attention to some extent as much as you need to, and most of the information is fluff, but then the key bits come through. Unlike with knowledge work, unlike with creative and focused heavy duty work, where virtually every minute is you being 100% focused. So status meetings are great for post-lunch. Um, administrative tasks are great for post-lunch. You want to clean up your your file system, you want to organize your your information, your material, you just want to get caught up, as it were. It's also a fantastic time to go through email. So if you've had your block of focus time in the morning, and I recommend you don't let email interrupt that, um, the afternoon is a fantastic time to get caught up on email, uh, reply email. It's, it's not entirely a mindless task, but it's not a task that requires heavy cognitive work. So We'll get back into the rest of the episode now, uh, talking about other things you can do post-lunch and beyond. So that's something you can consider doing um, around the mid afternoon around the early afternoon period. As we get into the later afternoon, um, melatonin is starting to creep up ever so slowly, right, as the evening um, sets in and the light starts to fade away. It's getting a little darker. Um, this is a fantastic time, interestingly, to do a different kind of cognitive work, as the research suggests, um, doing something that is more like a hobby. So it's still a little light out. You're still in a somewhat active phase, but you're not doing heavy cognitive work. This is a good time to maybe... Um, Paint, if you're a painter and it's not like you're a heavy lift for you, draw, a good time to read, a good time to perform something that is cognitive but not demanding, something that does not need heavy executive function, it doesn't need a lot of willpower to do. It's not a frog that you have to eat. Fantastic time to do that. For me, this is when I like to sit down and read some books, fiction, nonfiction, um, anything that's cognitively demanding but not too, too bad is great. If you play the piano and it's not stressful for you, if it's not like crazy difficult, this would be a good time to practice a little piano. If Again, if it's not what you do and you're not trying to maybe learn some really crazy, wicked skills. But remember, your psychomotor vigilance is good pretty much throughout the day. So that would be a good time to practice if you play an instrument. A lot of things you can do. The main thing, the main takeaway here is early evening is a good time to, if you do want to continue some cognitive work, don't make it a heavy lift. Also, early evening, circadian rhythm wise, from a, from a hormonal standpoint, your body temperature is starting ever so slowly to dip as the light goes down. It should, as it should be going down if you were all natural light, right? When it's getting dark. But then your serotonin starts to go up. And if you know anything about serotonin, it's the bonding hormone, right? Melatonin is the sleepiness hormone, as it were, and serotonin is the bonding hormone. This is a perfect time to spend with family. And it's roughly around the latest time, ideally, that you should be eating. If you're doing the early time restricted eating, um, which we'll talk about in a second, which the research shows to be way better for managing fat um, then you probably want to eat an, eat an earlier dinner, um, but we'll talk about that in a second. So this is a good time, early evening, late evening, getting into late evening, spending time with family is great. This is a good time to have dinner together as a family. You're optimized for that. You're relaxed. Everybody's relaxed. Talk about your day. Nothing too heavy in the cognitive domain. So something more communal, more family-oriented, more emotional is fantastic at this time of day. I love this part of my day personally, getting to come home, set, you know, chill out with the family, have a good meal, fantastic. Of course, 
no caffeine at this point, you know. Um, some people like to have an evening coffee. If it works for you, go for it. But the research suggests that it's not a good idea to be consuming caffeine, usually within 13 hours again that you plan to go to sleep. Definitely not within four to five hours of when you plan to go to sleep. Okay, so now we're getting into the late evening, right? Let's talk about time-restricted eating. Based on a one research paper called Effects of Time-Restricted Eating on Weight Loss and Other Metabolic Parameters in Women and Men with Obesity, there was really no benefit to a late time-restricted eating which is the window a lot of people use. Um, they would fast overnight and then break their fast at 12 or 1 p.m. and then eat till about 7 or 8 p.m. and then do it again. A lot of people like this because it's easier to stay uh, unfed till early afternoon and then eat, 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 and then eat until a little bit later in the evening and then do it again. This has, it's okay, I guess, because at the end of the day, a big benefit of time-restricted eating is calorie restriction. You can only eat so much within a certain amount of time, unless you're really determined. But this research that I just quoted to you shows that there was very little benefit metabolically, metabolically to a late time-restricted eating, but an early time-restricted eating. So we're talking about eating from between 9 or 10 a.m. to about 3 to 5 p.m. shows high impact on brown adipose tissue or fat tissue. So according to this research here, um, and the one I referenced earlier, circadian control of brown adipose tissue, which is fat tissue, it says the time of day is an important determinant of the fate of consumed nutrients. So in other words, when you eat has a huge impact on what that food becomes. You eat later, the food is more likely to become fat because your metabolism is slowing down based on the diurnal rhythm, right? And the circadian rhythm, It'll more, your body will more likely store that food as fat. Then if you ate earlier in the day, when you are active, when the metabolism is high, your body is more likely to burn that food and metabolize it differently, use it for other processes. There's a lot of nuance to this, obviously, a lot of conflicting information in the research, but from a very high level, and this seems to bear out in all the sources that I have seen, early time-restricted eating seems to work better with our rhythms and provide better metabolic outcomes than late time-restricted eating. So if you practice intermittent fasting, if you practice time-restricted eating, I recommend that you experiment with an earlier window, say again, between 9, 8, 9, 10 a.m. to 3, 4, 5 p.m., try to match it to what would typically be the active phase of light and dark, and you might find that you burn a lot more fat and you just get better metabolic outcomes that way. So now we're getting into the late evening. You should be done dinner now, preferably with family or loved ones, um, kind of winding down. Then you can get into the later part of the evening. So we're talking about 6, 7, 8 p.m., Serotonin and melatonin just continue to kind of increase because it's it should now be dark, should be darker right, right now, right? This is a good time for me when I do some easier reading. I try to avoid TV, but it's not always possible. I'll, I'll admit, this is when I tend to relax and watch a few shows. The blue light apparently isn't great for you, but I was listening to... Um, a podcast from one of the leading experts in this field, and I'll see if I can put a link to that somewhere around here somewhere. But the, the, the research shows that it's not as bad as people think. It doesn't impact your sleep as people think. It's not like if you watch TV for like an hour between 7 and 8 p.m., oh my God, you're not going to be able to sleep or whatever. It's not ideal, but it's not terrible. And this is the time that I have to catch up on shows, maybe watch podcasts or, or you know, watch um, something educational, a documentary or whatever, or just be entertained, this is when I do it. This is also a good time to start to do your evening ritual, which could include um, journaling or reading, physical, using physical paper, paper books, right? Um, it's a good way to start to wind down for the evening. If this is the only time you can exercise, after work, it's okay, but it's not great because the Zeitgeber of physical activity tends to 
elevates your core body temperature and makes it harder for you to go to sleep. So that's why I'm not a big fan of exercising later in the evening. But like I said before, if this is when you can exercise, go for it. It's better than not exercising. Um, you can counteract that by maybe practicing mindfulness after the exercise, taking a cool shower after the exercise to kind of counterbalance that um, effect of elevated body temperature. You definitely don't want to be eating a huge meal after you exercise at 7 or 8 or 9 p.m. because that just throws everything off kilter. Um, but if that's when you can exercise, not it's not great, but that's when you can exercise. The alternative is this is a good time to do some stretches. If you do mobility work, it's a good time to do some meditative stretches for the muscles, lengthen them out a little bit before you hit the sack when you'll be pretty much in one position. If you've had a day sitting at a desk, you know, you're and your muscles might be tight, everything might be a little tight, getting some good relaxing stretches in can really start to prepare your body to go to sleep. Um, as the night progresses, you might want to take a shower, a cool shower, a warm shower, it doesn't really matter. Either one will help your body regulate its temperature to start getting ready for bed. Um, some herbal tea, not with caffeine, is not a bad idea this time of night. Whatever routine helps you fall asleep. And ideally, by about 11 p.m., the circadian rhythm has built up so much sleep pressure from you being awake for so long that you probably want to be asleep. And this brings us to the concept of sleep time versus sleep opportunity. So if you go to bed at 10 p.m., you give yourself a sleep opportunity of eight hours if you intend to wake up at 6 a.m. But if you don't fall asleep until 11 p.m., you've actually only slept for seven hours, 11 to 6 a.m. So that understanding that there is sleep opportunity versus actual sleep is important. If you want to get eight hours of sleep, ideally, you want to be in bed, ready to go, giving yourself some buffer right, of when you actually fall asleep. So if you want to go to bed, at, if you want to be asleep by 1030, start your routine to get into bed, you know, winding down 30 minutes to an hour before. So that by 10 o'clock, you're in bed and hopefully by 1030, you're in there, you're in there sleeping well. Um, and that brings you to the end of the day. And you start another cycle, you start another cycle the next day. Um, doing things this way means that you can do less but get more out of it. If you're exercising at the best time, you optimize your performance and then you optimize the benefit of the exercise. If you couple that exercise with eating at the right time, you maximize your body's use of those nutrients to repair and rebuild your body and strengthen you from the exercise. And if you are sleeping at the best time, which is at nighttime, you're also getting the maximum benefits of the recovery from the exercise and building a stronger, more resilient and healthier body. When it comes to your work, value creation, if you're doing the heaviest, hardest tasks when you're optimized to do them, you will probably be working less than the less productive people, but because you're working in a way that is aligned with your rhythms, your circadian, diurnal rhythms, and you're using the proper zeitgebers, time givers, you will get more done than other people do. You'll get more done in an hour than most people will do, than most people will in three hours because you're working not only with the chronos, but also the kairos of the time to do it, and you're using your ultradian rhythm to your benefit. And then when it comes to your relationships, when you're spending time with your family, when possible, always, if you can, spend time with your family, obviously. But if you're maximizing the time with your family, you know, you're putting your children to bed when their serotonin is probably at its highest, when they're feeling the most closely bonded to their loved ones. If you're having dinner together as a family, if you're having family time at a point, at a time when it's the best time, really, to be engaging in those kind of bonding beautiful bonding behaviors. Again, you're doing more by doing less. Somebody else might be doing that same thing at a different time of day when nobody is in the physical or psychological state of mind to do those things. And that person obviously will not get the same benefit as you would get because you understand working with your rhythms. And 
just to, and to put a little point on the feeding thing, um, if you're using a time-restricted eating window that maximizes your body's metabolism, again, that's only that only can be a good thing. That brings us to the end of this episode. It's been a long one, but I hope it's been an informative one, an educational one, a useful one for you. Um, if you do decide to practice some of these principles, experiment with them, try them out, see how they work, tweak it here and there, but keep the basic principles in place. The understanding that our bodies work in sync with both the internal clocks that are tuned to light and also the external inputs, the Zeitgebers. Try your best to sync those two things over the course of your day and you will find yourself being able to do more with less effort. And so until the next episode, I am still Anthony Saini. And as we say here on 8020 Productivity, remember, it's not what you know that matters. It's what you do with what you know. Take care and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.